Hi there, I'm John, and thank you for choosing the comprehensive, simplified, and clear-cut medical surgical nursing, which will prepare you for your nursing qualifying examination. May it be the local RN here in the Philippines, or the NCLEX RN in the U.S., or other qualifying examinations, just like your DHA, HAAD, or Prometric. So this video clip will be, okay, will complement the purchase book, so feel free to pause, play, or replay as we go along with the discussion. If you have your book with you, Okay, if you notice, the first concept, the first part, we talk about fluids and electrolytes. Please be reminded that, that in any medical conditions or conditions, okay, it will greatly affect fluid and electrolyte status of the patient. That is why you need to understand the basic about fluids and electrolytes. Now remember, when I say fluids and electrolytes, let's start with fluid compartment. Now, in the body, there are two fluid compartments. Now, what are these two fluid compartments? The ICF, or the intracellular fluid, and the second is your ECF, or extracellular fluid. Now, here it is. In this is your blood vessel, okay? There are cells outside. Now, these cells, they have fluid inside. You call the fluid inside a cell as your ICF, or intracellular fluid. Outside the cell, there's another fluid, right? The fluid outside the cell is your ECF, or extracellular fluid. These two are fluid compartments in the body. Now remember, your ECF or the fluid outside the cell is subdivided into two. What are the two subdivisions of your ECF? The fluid inside the blood vessel is what we call your plasma. Remember, your plasma is inside the blood vessel. That is why another name of plasma is what we call intra vascular fluid. Another subdivision of your ECF is a fluid that can be found outside the blood vessel and outside the cell. You call that a short interstitial fluid. Now remember, interstitial can be seen outside the blood vessel. That is why another name of interstitial is your extra vascular fluid. Reminder, another name for plasma is intravascular fluid. Another name for interstitial is your extravascular fluid. I need to emphasize plasma here. Remember, we know this, that plasma, we know this in your anatomy, that plasma is component of your blood. And in the plasma, okay, there is an important protein. You call the protein in your plasma, okay, a sure albumin. Familiar? I hope so. Albumin is a protein that maintains oncotic pressure. Question, sir, what is oncotic pressure? Oncotic pressure is a pressure that holds, okay? It holds the fluid. In short, it attracts fluid, right? Now, there are conditions or disturbances or medical problems that will result to decreased albumin in the blood or referred as hypoalbuminemia. Now, what are common conditions that can cause hypoalbuminemia? Well, patients having liver problem or patient having nephrotic syndrome. That is why if you have nephrotic syndrome, the diet must be high-protein diet, right? Familiar? Nephrotic syndrome, frotic protein. That is why you have to increase protein, protein in the diet of the patient with nephrotic syndrome. Now, the question there is that what is the implication if you have hypoalbuminemia? Now, look. If this is your plasma and this part is your interstitial, now, if there is a decreased protein in the plasma, if there is decreased albumin in the plasma, common sense will tell us nurses that a decrease in the albumin will decrease oncotic pressure, right? Therefore, if there is a decrease in the oncotic pressure, nobody holds the fluid. Thus, if nobody holds the fluid to stay inside the blood vessel, the fluid will get out the fluid will get out because nobody is holding them together, right? So the fluid gets out. You call that condition now as fluid shifting. The question in your exam, what is the movement of fluid during hypoalbuminemia? Your answer will be plasma to interstitial. Remember, plasma to interstitial or intravascular to extravascular or intravascular to interstitial or plasma to extravascular, they're all the same. Having said that in your hypoalbuminemia, 
the movement is from plasma to interstitial. When this condition happens, when there is movement of fluid from the plasma to interstitial, expect that the blood volume will decrease. Am I right? Because the fluid gets out. When volume decreases, it leads to hypovolemia, right? And if not treated, hypovolemia progresses to shock, causing hypovolemic shock. That is why fluid resuscitation is essential. Am I right? Now, that is why the question there will be, what is the first line solution used to treat shock? What is the best or the maintenance solution used to treat shock? What are solutions yet said to be volume expanders? So we will answer those questions one by one. Now, when fluid accumulates in the interstitial compartment, the interstitial volume increases. Remember, the blood volume decreases the flu because the fluid gets out. The interstitial volume increases because there's accumulation of fluid there. Now, if interstitial volume increases, that leads to a condition called edema formation. Now, if the patient is edematous, what solution will you use? That is why in the hospital or in any medical setup, you have to understand the three common solutions used in the medical field and the three common solutions being used. And these solutions, they differ in their tonicity. I hope you can still remember the different solutions, okay? Now let's try to recap those solutions. So your A, B, and C. Okay, letter A, you have your isotonic solution. Okay, B, you have your hypertonic solution. And C, you have your hypotonic solution. Let's discuss them one by one. When you say isotonic solution, it is a solution where in the tonicity is almost the same with the body fluid. That is why in the tonicity or consistency, they're the same. Would you expect change in the cell? No, there's no change in the cell because they have almost the same tonicity, right? So here, no change in the cell. Now, what about hypertonic? Hypertonic solution is high pressured gradient solution. In short, it is high, if it is hypertonic, it is concentrated. Now, if the solution is concentrated, it needs water, right? That is why if you expose a cell in a hypertonic solution, the fluid inside the cell gets out. Why did the fluid get out? Because hypertonic attracts fluid. Therefore, if fluid from the cell gets out, what will happen to your cell? It will shrink, am I right? But the most appropriate term for that is cremation. So there will be cellular shrinkage or cellular cremation. Now what about hypotonic solution? Hypotonic solution is a low pressure gradient solution. In short, it is diluted. If it is diluted, there's too much water in it, right? If you expose a cell in a hypotonic, expect that the cell will swell because the fluid from the solution will get inside the cell. As fluid fills the cell of the patient, okay, the, okay, the cell swells. So there will be cellular swelling. So expect that there will be cellular swelling. Now let's try to recap the effects of these solutions. So these are the three beakers. The beaker A contains isotonic, beaker B contains hypertonic, and beaker C contains hypotonic solution. Let's get one blood cell and drop a single cell in each beaker. Drop cell wall nucleus. Remember, beaker A is isotonic, almost the same tonicity. Solution and stay fluid inside the cell, they have the same, almost the same tonicity. Will there be change? No change at all. The cell will not shrink nor swell, okay? Beaker B, it's hypertonic. The solution is concentrated. When you say concentrated, it needs water, right? Now, if you drop a single cell, cell will nucleus, the concentration here is so high, the solution is concentrated as a result. Fluid from the cell gets out. Fluid from the cell gets out. As a result, the cell will shrink or cellular cremation. In beaker C, the solution is hypotonic. In short, it is diluted. If you drop a single cell, the fluid from the solution will get inside the cell. Why? There's too much water in the solution. Therefore, the water in the solution will get inside the cell. As a result, the cell now will have what? Swelling. So there will be cellular swelling. Having said this, I hope you understand the concept well. The question now will be, what is the best solution used to treat patients with edema formation? 
Remember edema? There is an increase in your interstitial fluid compartment. What do you think is the best answer? Isotonic, hypertonic, or hypotonic for a patient with edema? What do you think is the answer? Mm -hmm. I hope you answered hypertonic because that is the correct answer. Now remember, if this is your blood vessel, plasma and interstitial, right? If there is edema formation, there is an increase in your interstitial fluid compartment. The best solution here is your hypertonic. Let's check. You hook the patient in a butterfly needle, and the butterfly needle is attached to a hypertonic solution. What will happen? When the hypertonic solution enters the vascular compartment, remember it is concentrated. Therefore, if the solution is concentrated, it attracts fluid. So whatever fluid you have in the interstitial compartment, okay, will get inside the vascular area because okay, the solution is concentrated. Therefore, if fluid moves from interstitial back to the plasma area or in your intravascular area, did it correct edema? Yes, it did. Therefore, the best solution used to treat patient with edema is hypertonic solution. Follow-up question. When fluid fills the blood vessel, when fluid fills the vascular compartment, did it increase the blood volume? Answer, yes. Therefore, hypertonic is a volume expander. Are you with me? I hope so. Now, when fluid accumulates in the vascular compartment, is it good or is it bad? Well, that depends. If there's too much fluid that accumulates or stays in the vascular compartment, it causes congestion, and then it's not good for the patient at all, right? Therefore, question, what drug must be given together with your hypertonic solution? Answer, diuretic drug. Why? The hypertonic will attract the fluid from the interstitial back to the plasma. When the fluid is inside the vascular compartment, it is now the job of your diuretic therapy, diuretic agent, to eliminate too much water in the vascular compartment. Why? Because diuretic promotes diuresis. Now, if you pee a lot, remember, if you pee a lot, you do not only lose fluid, you also lose what? Electrolytes. That is why you have to associate electrolyte imbalances during diuretic therapy. Now, this is actually a highlight in your exam. What are common fluids and electrolyte imbalances during diuretic therapy or diuretic drug administration? Well, that depends on the diuretic drug. Remember, we categorize diuretic drugs for agents in two. It could be potassium wasting. Remember, when you get potassium wasting diuretic, it eliminates potassium. So you have to expect hypokalemia. If you have potassium sparing diuretic, it means to say you will pee, but this drug will prevent potassium elimination. Potassium stays inside the body. Therefore, patient receiving potassium sparing diuretic, you have to watch out for hyperkalemia. Okay, are you with me? Okay, good. Now, I mentioned hypertonic. Remember, hypertonic is a volume expander. Is this a best solution used to treat patient with shock? Is this the first line solution? Answer, no. Therefore, hypertonic is a maintenance solution used to treat shock. The question there would be, what is the first line solution used to treat shock? And you have to bear in mind that that solution must be volume expander. Question, is isotonic a volume expander? What do you think is the answer? Well, we will see. Remember, there's no change. No change. Now let's check. Plasma, interstitial. Let's try to hook that, okay, to your isotonic solution. Remember, when isotonic solution enters the vascular compartment, remember that the tonicity is almost the same. In short, it will not attract fluid to get inside the vascular. It will never give fluid as well to your interstitial compartment. The isotonic solution will only stay inside the vascular compartment. It will not attract fluid nor give fluid. It will only stay inside, increasing the blood volume. Therefore. Is isotonic a volume expander? Answer, yes. Therefore, isotonic is the first line solution used to treat shock. Hypertonic is a maintenance solution used to treat shock. 
Remember, hypertonic is concentrated. What makes hypertonic concentrated? Glucose. That is why hypertonic is contraindicated for patient with DKA or to patient with HHNK. Please bear keep that in mind. Now, having said isotonic, hypertonic, and hypotonic, can you identify solutions? I hope so. Now, please be reminded of the different solutions used in the hospital or any clinical setup. When you say isotonic solutions, these are solutions said to be what? Plain solutions. So all solutions said to be plain are isotonic. Example, plain NSS, plain LR. So these are all isotonic solutions. Now, what about hypertonic? These are solutions said to be D5, all right? D10 and D50, except for D5 water, okay? Except for D5 water. Now, what about hypotonic solution? Hypotonic solution, these are solutions less than 0.90%. Are you with me? Just like your 0.45 NaCl, 0.80 sodium chloride. So anything that is less than 0.90%, it's your hypotonic solution. The question here, what about D5 water? If D5 water is not hypertonic, is D5 water isotonic or hypotonic? Answer, they're both correct. D5 water is isotonic and D5 water, sorry, D5 water is also hypotonic. That depends on its placement. Remember, D5 water is isotonic if that is outside the body. But the moment that D5 water enters the vascular compartment, that makes it hypotonic solution. So again, D5 water outside the body is isotonic. D5 water inside the body is hypotonic. Clear? Now, I mentioned a while ago that patient with fluid imbalance, we also associate that with electrolyte imbalances, right? Now, when you say electrolytes, what are electrolytes? Electrolytes are actually charged minerals, am I right? So when you say they are charged minerals, it could be a positively charged mineral or a negatively charged mineral. Remember, when you say positively charged mineral, these are what we call cations, am I right? When you say negatively charged minerals, these are your anions. Now, one technique or tip or mnemonic used in your fluids and electrolytes, okay, is of course the most common piso. Am I right? I don't know who or authored or formulated this piso, but I formulated another mnemonic and that is your pito. Now remember, your piso is positively charged. Your pico is negatively charged. Now what does it mean? Piso stands for potassium inside, sodium outside. Pico means phosphate inside, chloride outside. Now look, if this is your cell, the most abundant cation, remember cation is positively charged, the most abundant cation inside the cell is your potassium. The most abundant cation outside the cell is your sodium. The most abundant anion inside the cell is your phosphate. The most abundant anion outside the cell is your chloride. In short, potassium inside the cell, cation. Phosphate inside the cell, an ion. Now remember, if phosphate and potassium are intracellular electrolytes, are you familiar with blood transfusion? Oh, the dogs are barking. Please don't mind that. Now, are you familiar with multiple blood transfusion? If the patient requires multiple BT, please be reminded that you have, that you have to watch out for hyperphosphatemia and hyperkalemia. Why? For example, we transfuse blood to your patient, PAC RBC, we know for the fact that the lifespan of an RBC is 80 to 120 days. We don't know the age of the blood being transfused. Am I right? Therefore, if you transfuse blood to your patient, there may go into an early hemolysis. Therefore, if the cells now being transfused will die, okay, so you, don't, you, don't, you do not just transfuse blood to the patient, you also dump electrolytes to your patient. That is why Patients with multiple blood transfusion are at risk to have hyperkalemia and hyper 
cause of anemia. That is why expect or anticipate that in every pap RBC transmission, you have to give diuretic drug. This will prevent these conditions. Can you follow? Now, in your examination, I want you to familiarize as well as the different values and ECG changes okay, with the different electrolyte imbalances. Let's try to recap the different electrolytes okay, and their normal values. So you have your sodium, you have your potassium, you have your calcium, you have your phosphate, and magnesium. Just a reminder, you may have a different value, normal value, okay, that you used to follow. But remember, in the actual examination, okay, they will give extreme values. Remember, different textbooks that we use, they have different values as well. So in actual examination, okay, they, will, they will give you an extreme result. So that is what it will cover the different normal values that you encounter. Okay, so the normal sodium level is 135 to 145 millimole per liter or, or milli equivalent per liter. The normal potassium level is 3.5 to 5.0 milli equivalent per liter. Other book 3.5 to 5.5. Okay, the normal calcium level ranges from 8.5 to 10.5 milligrams per deciliter. The normal phosphate level is 2.5 to 2k okay, to 4.5 milligrams per deciliter. And of course, magnesium, it is your 1.8 to 2.7 milligrams per deciliter. Other book, 1.5 to 2.5. Now for your examination, I want you to, okay, to familiarize potassium, calcium, and magnesium. But of course, other electrolytes are important as well. Please be reminded of the different easy tracings of each particular okay, potassium and calcium Okay, as well as magnesium, can you follow? Okay, of ECG tracings, because sometimes okay, it will come out in your ex in your actual examination. So everything okay, is actually written in your the Chronicle of Medical Surgical Nursing comprehensive review notes. So this is just actually a supplementary or a supplementary video for your purchase book. So for more questions, feel free to email me and you have to watch out for another video tutorial. Thank you so much and God bless our profession.